So today I'll be talking about the INFP personality type, and there are two subtypes, descriptions provided by Megega and Okarov, then provide you with video examples to help pinpoint these personality types with the model examples I'm going to use for this video. As a quick side note, if you are a Myers-Bridge fan, I am talking about INFJ today, because the P's and J's are switched for the uh, socionics descriptions which I'm using for this video. So if you want uh, INFP descriptions, go to the INFJ video, which can be found in my uh, YouTube channel. So as a uh, description of the INFP intuition, introvert intuition subtype, uh, these types tend to be very calm, tactful, languid, and a diffident individual. They are inert, possess a fine intuition, they are serene, they present moodiness and melancholy. mimicry is somewhat monotonous, gait is dreamy and pensive, slightly restrained with a bit of luster, often expressing melancholy, attentiveness or sardonic irony, speech is measured, smooth and intimately heartfelt, constantly a polite half-smile, gestures are modest, timid, and undemonstrative. So, introverted intuition overview. Very calm, um, calm serene, moodiness, strained almost in a way as a but they're very uh melconis, so there's a very wistfulness pensiveness a sadness expression often to their vi um expression to the world but they're very insightful in the sense that they're very intuitive in describing things to other people um they're very polite at the same time but it tends to be very, um, there tends to be a somewhat moodiness in their expression to the world. So as the key variables, as an overview, quick summary, this tends to be very calm, melancholic, witful, dreamy um, person who presents themselves in a very um, in intuitive manner and in winning other people's favor effectively. So serene is an overview type of this description. Now for the extroverted feeling subtype for INFP, this type tends to give an impression of someone who's soft, charming, and an emotional person. They look inspired and optimistic. They are ironic, crafty, and unpredictable, creates original contrast, artistic and charming, unconstrained in conversation, occasionally even with shades of familiarity and abundance. At times they are simply charming, talented at persuasion, Movements are refined, speech is full of emotion, rich with shades, sometimes melodious. So as a quick summary or key points to look for, this is a very soft, charming, and emotional person. That's probably the best one sentence summary I can describe as personality type. So they are intuitive, just remember that, because that's their main function. Um, and they're very optimistic and very good at create, creating original contrast with other people. They can somewhat appear extroverted, but at the same time, just remember that they are introverts in the same way as uh, any introvert would be. So they are still reserved, um, calm in a way, but it's hard to notice it because they're very charming and they can be very artistic in their approach to the world. And they can present themselves in a very familiar manner. So a overall summary is just look for the charming, the soft charm in their emotional expression to the world. So they're, they're calm, but they're very charming and soft at the same time, and I have to emphasize that a lot as a overview of looking for this subtype. So, quick summary, the introverted intuition subtype, pensive, dreamy, melancholic, extroverted feeling subtype, more outgoing, extroverted, um, char charming and friendly, uh, and, but know how to connect with people as well. So those are the two descriptions. Um, other side notes, you know, the introvert type tends to be, um, they can be more, more, more philosophical and very and more idealistic in a way of trying to make the world a better place, while the extrovert subtype tends to be more practical in the way that they're very good at connecting with people in generally. So I'm going to leave you with video examples of these kind of personality types. Uh, you can find them at Academia, both types, but you can also find them in uh, uh, other intuitive aspects such as journalism or even politics at times, or even health. So those are the two subtypes. I'm going to leave you with, with examples, and I hope this video helped you to spot them as these descriptions helped me myself.
Mainstream media has been revealed through all of this over these last five weeks as not being mainstream anymore. Yeah. Because if you look at the polls now, most Americans actually support these Occupy Wall Street movements all over the country. Most Americans. And yet the because ridicule... Because thought there was something unfair about the, the Because rescue. there is a sense of injustice. Right. It is not about, oh, just go get the rich. Is it about? It's about the sense of inequality. And a number of wealthy people agree with this, that they should pay their fair share, that they uh, should have to pay proportionately as much as their secretary is paying in taxes. Um, it really... I think cuts across the political spectrum. And when you have a lot of the pundits you see on television, on the networks, you know, these people who know so little about so much, explaining the world to us and getting it so wrong. Um, yes, I mean, no one, uh, I, I called myself an elder reluctantly, but having seen the role of elders in First Nations communities, it's uh, something that I now feel very proud to say I am an elder. Elders in a First Nations community you go to a feast or, or an event. When an elder walks in the room, they're like rock stars. You know, they're the, the repository of all of that long traditional knowledge that's been, again, hard won over thousands of years. And uh, that is, they're all about stories. And one that comes to mind immediately we were doing a show, a uh, two-hour special on, on forestry, and I arranged with McMillan Blodell, one of the big logging companies, to interview three loggers uh, on Vancouver Island. And so we rolled up and uh, pulled out our camera. The loggers saw us. They were waiting, and they came out of the bush. The teacher read my essay in front of the class, and I always loved words every day. Uh, well, every night, we had to bring a new word to the dinner table. Wow. And, uh, well, that lasted not that long, but it was <laughs> over a period of time. But my best one was perspicacity, which I thought was a great word. And um, that is so, a good word. yeah, and so, um, my dad really encouraged me to pursue a career in journalism during at, I wrote for my high school newspaper in college. I went to the University of Virginia. I wrote for the Cavalier Daily, Wahoo Wah, if any UVA people are out there. And, um, and then during the summers, I worked at radio stations in Washington. Uh, well, uh, when you start in a, in a new position like this one, you, you think you come in prepared. But the truth is, is that when you start, when you're announced, the moment you're announced as a governor general, you become, you become it right away. So it's you learn on the job, uh, and that's very different from my previous job, where uh, when I became an astronaut, I was an engineer. I was coding uh, uh, for speech recognition applications, and I became an astronaut, and then ended up in Houston. Uh, we arrive there, and then we go through. Procedures. They tell us how to work this, and then we train for two years before we become a certified astronaut. And Governor General, you arrive, and You're it. it starts right off the starting block with no instruction manual. Data circuit now preaching some things that should be done. Uh, I couldn't get Congress to even listen to them. One was the line item veto. Now the line item veto, you know, the ability to go through a packet of bills and programs and pick things out that you think are extravagant and not in the welfare of the people and veto them. 43 governors have that right. I had it when I was governor of California. The Congress will not allow the President of the United States to do that. I think that another thing that Congress always opposed me on was the idea of another amendment to the Constitution that was first suggested by Thomas Jefferson and that was a provision in the Constitution that prevents the federal... ...big impact on me um, because it treated me seriously. It informed me about things like climate change and pollution, and it empowered me with practical suggestions of what I could do to make a difference. And when I talk to kids today, they're curious about the world around us. I think they're more engaged than adults often think they are, um, and they want to know what they can do. And so I hope that It's Your World impacts even one kid in the same way that 50 Simple Things impacted me. Um, in my book, I talk about issues like climate change, but also access to education, the reality that so many girls don't have the same opportunities that their brothers do around the world, poverty, inequality. But I also talk about kids who are already making a difference in these areas, and some adults too, 
but mainly kids, because I believe that with a little bit of information, kids can make a difference. And the stories I share in my book are a real testament to that. Kids are engaged. Jen to be on politics, I'm Catherine Clark. The Right Honourable Joe Clark was Canada's youngest Prime Minister and Canada's only Alberta-born Prime Minister. He's also my dad, and I'm thrilled to have Joe Clark join me now in Ottawa for a chat about life beyond politics. It's great to have you here, Dad. Great place to be here. It was Thank really you. tough to arrange this interview with you. I just couldn't get you to hammer down the time. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm glad you're here. Um, I have to admit, though, that this is probably one of the most, um, well, I suppose I should, nerve-wracking is probably the best way to describe an interview. Generally, I'm interviewing people that I don't know much about, but I grew up with you. So, Although reading your biography, I learned a whole bunch of things I didn't know. The um, David Humphrey's biography. Yes. Take a look at the statements. The statements are that they don't think, they said in the, actually goes back to Khomeini at the time of the U.S.-Iranian alliance, uh, the uh, Israeli-Iranian alliance, and Israel didn't care about it then. And it keeps being repeated. The statement is that you know, in the course of time, uh, Israel should no longer exist. Well, actually, I happen to agree with that, too. In fact, so do a lot of people in Israel, the ones who think there should be a single democratic state. That's not calling for wiping anyone out. In fact, Iran has supported the uh, international consensus on the two-state settlement. Uh, actually, there is, there are two countries that are not only calling for some nation not to exist, but are destroying it, namely the U.S. and Israel. That's their position with regard to the Palestinians. And they're not just saying it, I stress, they're not just saying it, they're doing it day by day. That's the meaning of the policies that are going on right before our eyes in Gaza and the West Bank, which we are supporting. Are weaker, some of them can draw, some of them can write, some of them are wonderful mothers right. and others are wonderful carpenters. Uh, all of the inequality that you see are all characteristics of a personality. So when you connect with somebody and you feel equal, that is a soul to soul. Equality is understanding that there is nothing and no one in the universe more important than you. And there is nothing and no one in the universe less important than you. All right. Now, here's the thing that equality can teach you. If you don't feel equal, you're going to feel either superior or inferior. Mm -hmm. And both superiority and inferiority. The, um, I'd say for the soul, there are certain um, uh, intentions. Mm -hmm. And that's the ones that I always try to uh, work out in my life. And that's sharing and cooperation. And right. yes, and reverence, reverence. for life. Absolutely. And, and also uh, harmony. And when you say harmony, oh, that's a good thing to ask because most people think if I'm harmonious with someone, it means that I'm in agreement with them or I don't make waves. I make sure everything's, you know, mm -hmm. uh, harmonious, but that's not harmony. Harmony is being in your integrity. It's saying what needs to be said, whatever is whatever's going on in any situation. Grandfather's regiment, and indeed my, my great-grandfather's regiment. And it was a very strange time. This was the early 1990s, so Cold War had ended. Nothing else had really begun. Nobody in my regiment had actually been to war since the Korean War for 40 years. Two generations had gone through. And it was almost unimaginable for me then that we would suddenly find ourselves, as indeed the regiment did, in Bosnia, in Kosovo, in Iraq, in Afghanistan. It felt like a strange um, unit stuck in the middle of Britain, preparing for some war against the Soviet Union, which clearly was never going to happen. And, and so talk a little... Strange time. I mean, I, I joined the army when I was 18 as a young infantry officer. And I felt at the time that it wasn't quite what I expected. You know, everybody has their own personality, and if he'd like to do that, that's fine. That's not who I am. Uh, and I don't get into the mud pit, and I'm not going to be talking about people. Uh, I will tell you in terms of energy, I'm not sure that there's anybody else running who's spent 18 or 20 hours uh, intently operating on somebody. Do you think that people mistaken your uh, soft-spokenness with, with a lack of energy? I think so. Um, I have plenty of energy, but, you know, I am soft-spoken. I 
do have a tendency to, to be relaxed. Uh, I wasn't always like that. <laughs> there was a time when I was, uh, you know, very volatile. Uh, but, you know, I changed. Doing this close contact with the poorest of the poor. But before that, it was a vocation. From the time I was 12 years old. 12. That calling to, be, to belong to Jesus. Now, is that... It was, that was the sacrifice that Christ asked of us, no, that, uh, because we were a very happy and very united family. But um, God asked for the sacrifice from my people and from me. And, uh, were you a religious family? Had you been brought up to believe, as you do now, that everything was for God? Yes, I think my mother was a very holy uh, woman. And so she imparted that love for God and love for the neighbor very much into all her children's hearts.